Nothing tastes better than greens fresh from the earth. When you add meat to make a hearty salad, well, that's a meal. And it's my mission today. The husband thinks that any salad is just rabbit food, but I came up with a salad that is so manly, even he couldn't resist. My warm steakhouse salad with blue cheese dressing. And you get to do this. At the end of a bad day at the office, Grill Queen Elizabeth Carmel comes to cook. We're making one of my favorite, favorite meals. It's chicken paillard mm -hmm. over a Greek farmer salad Ooh. with tzatziki sauce. Oh, perfect it's for so summer. refreshing and so delicious. And so healthy, really. Then we visit Wholesome Wave, a unique program that pairs food stamps and farmers markets. Thank you. And I'm going to take one of my favorite appetizers, which is melon and prosciutto, and blow it up into an entree salad. And everybody's going to get their own personal mason jar salad. Ooh, that's so pretty. Hardy Salads, today on Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Hi, I'm Sarah Moulton. Welcome to Sarah's Weeknight Meals. I have my buddy here, Elizabeth Carmel, and she is the expert on grilling and specifically well, grilling for women. Thank you. Because you are the executive chef at Hill Country Barbecue and you've written so many books on the subject. We okay, are. so what are we making today? <laughs> we are grilling. Okay, I have to tell you, we're making one of my favorite, favorite meals. It's chicken paillard mm -hmm. over a Greek farmer salad Ooh. with tzatziki sauce. Oh, perfect it's for so summer. so refreshing and so delicious. And so healthy, really. Yeah, and you know what? There are layers and layers and layers of flavor. Um, if you can do me a favor and pound those chicken breasts. I'm going to. Um, I have a little technique that I love doing is I put a little bit of oil in the bag. Isn't that interesting? I put a little bit of water in the bag. Well, uh, but hey, oil makes sense too. You know what? This is a case where oil and water is going to mix. You got it. <laughs> so. There you go. Okay, so a little bit of oil so it doesn't yes. tear when we're pounding exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So I'm going to make the wet rub. I love this. I'm going to put a little garlic, a little lemon zest. My teacher, my grilling guru, has always told me to start by preheating the grill. You're right. So that's the first step. Is okay, to always I'll start whacking the grill. away. I'll okay. do that right now. This is a great thing to do when you're in a bad mood. It just sort of gets it all out. Yeah, well, you know, cooking is very therapeutic, it right? It is. And there's nothing more therapeutic than pounding chicken. You know, a lot of people I know tend to buy garlic that's already minced because they don't want to mince it. Oh, it tastes so awful, don't It you tastes think? so awful. So I say don't do that, but instead of having to worry about mincing it with a knife, if you use a little rasp like this, you get perfectly grated and minced garlic. And I'm gonna zest a couple of lemons, and I wanna make sure I don't get any of the bitter white pith while yes. I'm doing it. about got it. That looks good, doesn't it? That looks perfect. Okay, That's I'll just, great. Okay, I'll just let them slither on in here. Okay, and now I'm going to actually uh, remove the garlic and the lemon. I like to use a really coarse sea salt and then just a dab, literally a dab, a quarter teaspoon of water. water. And this is almost as therapeutic as you it's pounding the away I with love this. Rolling pin, yes. And the salt really helps extract a lot of flavor from the lemon zest and the garlic. Oh, I'm going to measure yes. the oregano yes. here? Yes, we need one teaspoon. Why are we using dried? You know what? In, in any kind of rub for grilled food, mm -hmm. it's much better to use dried herbs. This is a little bit of a wet rub mm -hmm. because the dried herbs, first of all, they're more powerful, so okay. you need less of them. And then secondly, we want to get a nice crust on the food, and the wetter it is, the longer it takes to get that crust on the food. So we're also gonna put about a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. And you know what? We might just put a tiny bit more oil on there. Mm -hmm. Cause you know what I always say, oil, oil the of, food, not, not the, the grate. Grill. Not the grate, right. not the grill. Okay, so you can see here that we just have a little bit more than a tablespoon, mm -hmm. but it's extremely flavorful. And so it really packs a real punch. So I'm just gonna divide that in four. Let's just brush it so that there are no clumps. So how long do we marinate this for? We're going to let this marinate for 30 minutes, and it's okay. really important to let it marinate for 30 minutes because 
That way, the first quarter inch of the chicken will really absorb all those flavors. And I noticed because we've got salt in there, it's almost like we're sort of brining it a little. You're exactly right. So I'm just gonna put a little bit more oil on just to make sure that the chicken doesn't stick and that it stays really juicy on the inside. Oh, this is gonna be so good, I can't wait. This is a gas grill. We could use charcoal, we could use a grill pan, but since we're using a gas grill, we preheated it to what? We preheated it um, with all the burners on high mm -hmm. um, until it got over 500 degrees, and then I reduced the heat to a medium um, heat of about 400. And we're gonna cook this over direct heat using... Oh, we start with those. Using my favorite. Red tongs, because red means raw. Okay. F stop, raw food, touch these. And then when after I turn them and they're ready to come off the grill, we're gonna use the green tongs, because green means go, cook food, touch And if you these. didn't have these snappy little tongs, you could just put a strip of red or a strip of green on two separate tongs to keep exactly. them straight. Exactly. So remember, Sarah, you wanna oil the food, not the grate. This is so important. Mm -hmm. This is, when people realize this, it changes their grilling life. Changes their life. It changes their grilling life, okay. at least. Okay, so if you oil the grates, which a lot of people do, what happens is you've preheated the grill, right? And so that is a torch ready to happen, right? You've got an oily paper towel, and you go against the grates, and that could easily ignite. So it's a fire hazard, that's number one. But number two, oil burns really, really quickly, and then it becomes really tacky. You know how you felt the bottom of a saute pan yes. that hasn't been washed well and it's sticky? So that's what happens to the cooking grates, and then it's like gluing your food to the cooking grates. Wow, okay, that's, if nothing, that's more compelling right. than anything I've ever heard But before. then the real food reason is, is if you oil the food, all the juices stay inside the food, it promotes caramelization, and you know how important those roasty, toasty grill marks are. And it also prevents stickage. Okay, well, there you go. So there you go. That's why you always should oil the food, not the grates. What if you want to make those cool crosshatches? Oh, how do I you do I love crosshatches. Let's do it. I'll okay. show you. Luckily, I put all of the chicken straight on the grates. Mm -hmm. So basically, all you want to do is you want to pick it up and turn it 25%. Okay. And then you'll get those great crosshatch marks. So now I'm just turning it at an angle. Mm -hmm. And I'll get that. Okay. So Look how beautiful that three looks. Three minutes on that side. Three minutes on this side. Total. So it's three to four. So it's been there about two. We'll leave it another two, and then we'll flip it over. Do you want me to chop parsley or something yes, while we're waiting? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Why don't you do that? And I will actually cut some lemons. We should turn them, right? We should, yes. Okay, so now do we switch to our green tongs? No. No, we're gonna turn them first, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna switch. So look at those gorgeous grill marks. I love it, they're beautiful. Aren't they beautiful? And I'm gonna meanwhile get our salad here, um, and this is our Greek salad, so we've just got tomatoes and cucumber and onion and olives and um, tzatziki, right? Which and, is right, right, and I love this salad. This is my favorite favorite salad, there's no lettuce to it. It's just all the yumminess of a salad. Do you think we're ready yet? Let's look. I'm all right, very now good. we're gonna use the green tongs. Okay, and how are you gonna know when it's done? You know what, I'm gonna know by touching it and also by looking to see if the meat has shrunk up. Uh -huh. The great thing about um, meat, though, too, is as you let it rest, it also continues to cook a little bit. So this will probably continue to cook about four or five Degrees. So I think that's perfect. Beautiful crosshatch marks. Yay! Yay! Is this something that needs to rest after we take it off? Yes. All, uh, all meat needs to rest because that allows the juices to reabsorb, and that's especially important for chicken, especially boneless, skinless chicken, which has a tendency to be sort of tough, tough and dry. dry. Yeah. And letting it rest will really make a big difference. Right. I can't wait to eat this. Look how beautiful it so looks. So gorgeous. And it does give off some juice. Here, I'll hold it for you. Okay. There. Well, it's still hot. You just squirt Sweet. some lemon on top so that it really gets another nice burst of lemon. Oh, I love this. And we're going to put a little lemon zest. So okay. you put the parsley, and I'll put a little lemon zest. Oh, what a nice idea. 
What yeah. a great thing to make. I mean, this is a weeknight meal for the family, but this would be great for entertaining, too. Well, thank you so much for our grilled chicken paillard with country Greek salad. Yes. Yay. We got to try this. I know. I I'm going to go, go get some pork. My name is Christine Bassett. My husband and I run Killaman Bassett Farmstead in South Glassbury, Connecticut. And we, with our five children and our 84-year-old partner, Henry Killam, run this farm stand and support our families on it. My name is Jesse Steele. I'm a hairdresser. My son, Caden, is a year and a half, and I think it's very important for his physical growth to consume fruits and vegetables on a regular basis. Thank you. Christine and Jesse, two mothers, live radically different lives in totally different communities, yeah, the but they were brought together by this man. Michelle Nishan founded an organization, Wholesome Wave, that makes healthy food more affordable. And what they found was that in poor neighborhoods, it isn't just a lack of grocery stores that keep people from eating fruits and vegetables. There once were grocery stores in these communities, and when the economic climate changed and most of the people living here didn't have money to shop the entire grocery store, buy fresh fruits and vegetables, the grocery stores left. So we really felt that affordability was, was the key. So they used private money for a pilot program that essentially doubled the value of food stamps spent on fruits and vegetables. Use my card for $10, please. So we're going to swipe your card for 10 and then we're going to do 20 in token. Excellent, thank you. Jesse is a customer, part of an assistance program for low-income women with children. When I use my card, say I spent $10, they will give you $10 in tokens. So you get like a free $10 to spend on whatever you'd like within the market. $8.50. It's a win-win. <laughs> By interacting with the farmers, you, you get to know them on a personal level. How their food is grown, you know there's no pesticides, no chemicals, I don't have to worry about what's in it. That's where Chris comes in. Her farm used to sell their produce wholesale at a third of the price they got at the farmer's market. Now it's even better. Mm -hmm. Our sales at the farmer's markets have doubled since we've started taking the coupons. We found that um, certain ethnic people wanted uh, collard greens, bok choy, so we decided that we would add that to what we're growing. It makes a huge impact on what we grow. The program has been so successful that a farm bill last year provided $100 million to double food stamps when spent on fruits and vegetables. It was the rare bill with bipartisan support. So we had democratic support because we were proving that underserved consumers want to feed their families better. On the right side of the aisle, the farmers hire more people, they put land in production, they make infrastructural investments. That's classic American small business support. I think we'll take some peaches. So on this day, two mothers, Christine Thank and Jesse, you. meet at Bridgeport, Connecticut's farmer's Apple. market. Not because it's trendy or fun, Apple. but because for them, it's a vital go. part of being a mom. Thank you, Thank you very much. This is my son, Caden. He's smart. He's very intelligent for his age. And I really think that, bottom line, it's from being fed healthy foods. Farming life for us, the best part about it is being able to spend time with my five children and my husband. Every part of what we grow or produce has our heart and soul in it because it's our pride. You know, the husband thinks that any salad is just rabbit food. He won't touch it. But I tricked him. I came up with a salad that is so manly, even he couldn't resist. We're going to start here with a potato pancake. Let me just get this last bit of uh, peel off. And the potato that we're using is a baking potato, generally called a russet. My favorite way to grate, period, anything, potatoes, vegetables, is on the grating disc of a food processor because it just goes so quickly. Besides which, at the end of a bad day at the office, it's sort of fun, you know? Here we go. 
Okay, olive oil. You can use either a non-stick pan, or I have here a stick-resistant pan. Just a little bit of olive oil in the bottom. And then every, all of these go in there at once. I'm gonna smush them down. You want about a medium heat, medium to medium high. And then just give it a smush. So while that's cooking away, got to be patient, just walk away, we're going to get our steak on. Now, this is just a good old, you know, New York strip sirloin steak. It's pretty thick. Um, so it's going to take, I think, about five minutes to side. You know, for this, because it is a manly salad, we're probably going with about six ounces per person. But generally with protein, I try to keep it at more like four ounces per person. Okay, so we're gonna get this in here. Yeah, that's the sound you wanna hear when you add your steak to the pan. If you don't hear that sizzle, the pan just wasn't hot enough. So I'm just gonna slice an onion here. Now, you noticed I didn't season this side of the steak. I don't season side two until right before I flip it. Because if I seasoned it now and it sat there for five minutes, this side would be all wet. And then when I turned it over, the steak wouldn't sear. All right, dressing time. So I'm making a creamy blue cheese dressing because again, this is my steakhouse salad. And uh, we're gonna start with a little garlic. So just a couple of garlic cloves. This guy's really tiny. Okay, we need about a tablespoon of fresh lemon juice here. Don't ever use that bottled stuff. It just doesn't have the same flavor. And we're gonna squeeze that right in there. And then we have some sherry vinegar. Now, sherry vinegar is one of my favorite vinegars. I tend to reach for it a lot because it doesn't just have the acid. It really has sort of a nice smoky taste from the sherry. So two tablespoons of this. I'm gonna add a tiny pinch of salt. And then some mustard. Two teaspoons Dijon mustard. And what's a steakhouse without Worcestershire sauce? We need two teaspoons of this. There we go. And then slowly add our oil. And now we're gonna add some sour cream. This is what makes it creamy. It's about a third of a cup, and then some blue cheese. Okay, and that's about a third of a cup also. I need to get my steak flipped over, so let me do this first. I'm gonna season it now that I'm gonna turn it. Oh, wow, what a beautiful sear. Okay, we're gonna give that about another four or five minutes. Let me check our potato here. Okay, here we go. So I can see one part's gonna stick, but I'm gonna just make this work. There we go. Now I'm gonna season this side, and I fetch you my steak is done. Let me just touch it. Now the way you can tell with a steak or a piece of meat if it's done is the more it cooks, the more well done it gets, the firmer it gets. So when you touch it, yeah, you can see there's a little bit of give, which means that it's Probably rare to medium rare. I'm gonna put it on a plate and let it rest. It's very important when you're cooking meat or any kind of protein to let it rest because what happens is the juices go back in and redistribute so that it's completely evenly juicy inside. If I slice this right now, all the juices would come streaming out and we'd have a dry steak. I mean, who wants the dry steak? Okay, now I'm gonna add my onions. And we're gonna make these nice and brown. I can clean up a little bit while I'm waiting. So you see how nicely it comes together after 10 to 12 minutes each side? You just keep smushing it, and eventually you end up with one big potato pancake. So we're gonna take this out, and we're gonna cut it in fours. Everybody gets their own quarter of it. It's the crunchy part at the bottom of the plate. And meanwhile, my steak has been resting and uh, it's given off a fair amount of juice, which is what happens whenever you let protein rest. And you don't wanna waste that juice, it's delicious stuff. So we're gonna add it right to our onions, create a little bit of a sort of sauce there, and get our steak down here to slice. We're gonna get rid of the fat, which we cooked on it, just to give it a little bit of flavor from the fat. There we go, oh yeah, that's very rare. 
And then we're gonna just do some cross cut slices. Let's see, that's about enough. I've got my spinach in the fridge. I washed and spun it dry. We're gonna start with the potato on the bottom. We'll top it off with some beautiful steak slices. Wow, that's gorgeous, isn't it? Put some onion on top. Put all that yummy steak juice in there. I'll just put a little bit of spinach on either side. And finally, a drizzle of blue cheese sauce. Now, could you really call this a salad? I don't think so. This is just way too hearty to be called a salad. And I know the husband would be very, very happy with it. That's it. My warm steakhouse salad with blue cheese dressing. favorite appetizers, which is melon in prosciutto, and blow it up into an entree salad, which you can pack up easily and take on a picnic. So let's start with the watermelon. Um, how do you know a watermelon is ripe? First of all, melons are, have to have been picked ripe. There's nothing you can do to ripen them after they've been picked. But what you're looking for is this little yellow spot. What that means is that it spent enough time, actually that yellow spot would have been down. It spent enough time ripening that it got sort of that blonde spot in the bottom because that blonde spot never saw any sun. And as for a cantaloupe, smell the stem end and it should smell like cantaloupe. Of course, if it's overripe, it will also smell like cantaloupe, but there's nothing you can do about it at that point. Okay, so I've already cubed up some cantaloupe and now I'm gonna cube up some watermelon. We got these little guys, which are very easy to work with and their seeds are pretty soft so you don't have to worry about, you know, really removing them. Okay. I'm gonna add something to it also that's not usually in there, which is fresh mint. I just think, what a nice addition. So why don't I finish up with the mint? I'm just gonna take some leaves off and uh, rip them a little bit. Okay. There we go. Now, I'm gonna get my prosciutto ready. And we got some prosciutto, we, we got it sliced at the store. And we just asked for it to be sliced a little thicker. I'm gonna shred it rather than chop it. So there is our prosciutto. Now on to the feta. You can have all sorts of textures from very soft to rather hard and crumbly. The feta I'm working with today is in the rather soft category. This has been packed in brine like a lot of good fetas are. For a feta like this, I've got a secret trick. Don't be grossed out. I learned this about cutting cheesecake or goat cheese, and it works very well for feta, which is, you know, floss. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do with the floss. Just, it's sort of fun, too, really. You feel very powerful. This is, I could do this all day long. This is a magic trick. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with the lighter colored melon. We're gonna do a stripe of each and everybody's gonna get their own personal mason jar salad. So first, the cantaloupe. And then a sprinkling of mint. This is all gonna become one when you eat it. Very pretty presentation. Now our watermelon. Oop. Then the feta cheese. I just love its salty, tangy, you know, sharp taste. And this particular creamy kind of feta, I'm wild about. And finally, the prosciutto. So now we're layered. Ooh, that's so pretty. I am going to make the dressing. It's not really a dressing, it's a drizzle. We're gonna start with um, a fresh lime. We want a tablespoon and a half. And a hefty pinch of salt. And my paprika, half a teaspoon. I need five tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. This is one of those times, reach for the good stuff because you will taste it and appreciate it. I'm just gonna whisk it 
and I'm gonna take a tiny taste to make sure I've got enough. We, you don't really need a lot of salt because as we know, we got a lot of salty ingredients in there. Hmm, wonderfully smoky. Okay, now, before we go on our picnic, we just drizzle a little bit down there and it will work its way down. As you stick your fork in, you're gonna sort of push the ingredients down and they will mix themselves up. So there you go. My two melon feta and prosciutto salad. Perfect for your next outing.